The Lou Waters Yerba Buena Jazz Band continued through World War II at the Don Club. However, most of the guys went off to war. The gentleman they left in charge uh, didn't pay the taxes. So the problem that occurred is when they returned from war in 1945 and wanted to get going again, they realized they owed the IRS a whole lot of money. They were all super psyched up about going back to work as a band and they rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed, went in, they had a built-in crowd that remembered them from before World War II, plus new, new fans. They were broadcasting on KGO, they were making records on the, the West Coast label, and it was just taking off. It was going great, uh, and there, as far as I know, there were no arguments, no personal problems, no nothing, but with the tax problem, that finally drove them out of the, the Dawn Club, finding out that uh, their investments had not been taken care of and uh, they had a huge liability to the IRS. They had to do something. So I think that Lou decided it was time to go elsewhere and they moved to El Cerrito. And El Cerrito was, that was a, um, it was uh, Sally Rand's old strip club. It was a big place. So I think they had this notion they were gonna get maybe even bigger crowds over there. But it, there wasn't much out there. And it was kind of a sin district. So, you know, so I think they had this idea they were gonna attract a lot of people. And they did do well initially, but it was a long trip. Waters Band was really exciting. It was full of, uh, full of drive, excitement. The guys were on fire with it. And no other musician I'd ever seen dominated every aspect of a band the way Lou did. That band was really Lou's band. And he, for example, put the rhythm section in, he stood in the back. Normally the horns stand in the front of a, of a band, but, and the leader would be out in the front of the band. But Lou stood in the back of the band on a riser with the, all the horns back there and played over the front, over the, uh, the heads of the rhythm section. We set the band up so the rhythm played along uh, just like they wanted, at full volume, and didn't try to follow the instruments too much. In other words, uh, uh, after World War II, when we got together, I remember telling them that uh, the rhythm section, if any, anybody's to be blamed on this, they can blame me, but I remember telling the rhythm section to play right on, and if they shot the horns dead one by one, that they weren't even to bat an eye, you know. In other words, uh, quite a few jazz bands, they follow the horn, and they follow them closely like a shadow. One of the great things that's in our archive here, the San Francisco Traditional Jazz Archive that lives at Stanford, is a lot, we have a lot of memorabilia from Hambone Kelly's. More than I thought was possible. And uh, we have menus. And we have Lou's, we actually have Lou's uh, recipes. We also have this great logo that, that became like the Hambone Kelly's logo, which is a picture of Lou in a chef's suit He's got his trumpet under his arm and he's got a platter with a ham bone on it. There's a lot of stuff on the walls, including uh, up behind the bar, all of the tunes the band played. He was the guy in the kitchen. At some point they occasionally served as many as 600 dinners I have read at Hambone Kelly's. Lou did not like to delegate authority. So he, he paid all the bills, he led the band, he made the program up, and he cooked the food. I had a friend who went to Hambone Kelly's in 1950 and ordered a hamburger. And he said he waited an entire set and all of an intermission, and at the very end of the intermission, Lou came out of the kitchen with his hamburger and put it on the table in front of him. And he said, it was the best hamburger I ever had, but that's one more weight on Lou to, uh, to have to be the chef on, on top of that. He did, however, like having the door right behind the bandstand 
because he didn't like to talk to people. He was not a people person. So play the last note, put the horn down, go through that door and cook. That was, that was an escape for him. A lot of the Yerba Buena jazz musicians lived at Hambone Kelly's. <laughs> I'm sure the rent was very reasonable there compared to Market Street and Annie Alley, and uh, they just decided to make a go of it as a co-op. You know, if you want to, you can uh, put your money back into running the band. You can help paint the walls uh, and put in the pipes and the in the toilets, and you can live with your wife upstairs if you want to. And that that was doomed to failure too. Uh, because some of the guys wanted to be salaried performers. Wally Rose and, and Bill Dart, and the drummer in particular, didn't want to be part of the co-op. Lou was a proto-hippie. Let's just get it right out there. And Lou had a lot of uh, ideas that would have uh, done really well in a summer of love, but didn't really do so well in the 1940s. The problem was that the musicians weren't getting paid. And I think that the idea of the co-op just didn't fly, and a lot of the guys left for that reason, because you gotta get, musicians have to pay their bills. Well, what went wrong is that business fell off uh, because of the, I think because of the commute and the ever fickle uh, tastes of the American public. Also, I do think that losing Turk Murphy and Bob Scobie were both things that did not help. When Turk finally left the Yerba Buena band, for some time he had a vision in his head of how he thought the music ought to ought to be. He wanted a smaller band, less heavy rhythm section, and a different repertoire, n different uh, selection of tunes, and more tightly arranged than, than what he was getting with, uh, with Waters. Bob Scobie the same. He got tired of the heavy rhythm. And they also, uh, Scobie and Turk, recorded uh, with their own groups, mainly Yerba Buena Jazz Band Sidemen, at the end of 1947, the uh, Musicians Union ha was about to put on a ban against all recording. So Scobie and Turk both thought, well, let's make a record, at least we'll have a record with our names on it. Um, so they both recorded under their own name with largely sidemen from the Yerba Buena band. I think that was a big crack in the armor with, with Lou. Also, for the patrons who were used to hearing the band at the Dawn Club and on the recordings with Scobie and Turk to show up, make all that long drive to get out to El Cerrito, and there's a totally different band on the stand without Turk and without Scobie. I, I just, I think the writing was on the wall at that point. Lou was a kind of a bohemian character, and, uh, and uh, he was not a, a PR man or a salesman or a for a real good front man for the band. He was a great musician, a great artist, uh, not a personality out front type. And it's always puzzled me how Lou put his horn down, but this is part of his eccentricity. This is the story of, and you understand a little more when you factor that in, what, a, what an unusual person Lou was and how all this is so odd the way Waters came to the surface. And he comes and, and like with a, as a bombshell figure and he goes away. And uh, so I think they were, he was having trouble. I think that the club economically was having trouble. I think that he was having trouble with uh, keeping the band together. And I'm sure he was frustrated. But at one point, he just stopped. He just, there was the last night, he put his horn away and he never played again. However, the music prospered beyond Lou Waters, and uh, and this whole business spawned a whole variety of bands playing in the style, imitating to a, one degree or another what Waters had started. And Murphy reflected this, and the people that Murphy inspired continued to reflect this and do to this day. I believe in the music that the music is not going down and out. It might 
taper off and uh, might rise high, but it could always come alive and could always enjoy a certain amount of popularity. It's, in other words, I figure it is never dead. <laughs>